It's good to see you. Can you hear me okay? Do you know what? There may be curling in my future. <laughs> this is so awesome. I, yesterday I mentioned curling as a distinctly uh, joyful thing about Canada that, that I love. And I was walking down the hall to come in here for this session, and this very athletic-looking man was coming down the hall toward me, and he stopped and he said, would you like to learn how to curl today? <laughs> and I paused and said, why, yes, yes, I would. And, and, and so, <laughs> I just signed up for Medicare, you know. <laughs> I just, it's probably a good thing. Anyway, he's there. Yeah. They're closed. No. So if anybody here has a hookup with the local curling club, we have to get a lane there. <laughs> okay? Help us out. That's right. That's right. Because I love the broom and I love the, the sort of polite nature to it. Canadians have hockey on the one side for the bloodthirsty among us, and then curling for the polite people, right? <laughs> so. Oh, OK. Well, you never know. You just never know what the day will bring. So in this short session, I want to talk to you a little bit about future church, future church. I don't know about you, but I feel really excited about what God is doing today. I'm not scared. I'm not afraid because things are changing and the church has to change. To me, this is exciting. We're on the front end of a new reformation. We get to be part of that. Anybody say amen in the Mennonite church? <laughs> we get to be a part of that. And so let's go do that. Let's, let's quit, let's quit sh hunkering down and feeling nervous and wondering if the sky really is going to fall this time. So here's some pictures from uh, Spring Forest where I live. There, there, we have a big uh, campfire area in the front of the house on the farm. And we've started having monthly campfires to invite friends to just come and socialize and get to know us. This is Francis and Agnes, Francis Kenua and Agnes Karimi and their three children. They are a family from Kenya. And they live in community with us at the farm. There are two houses. And we are a new monastic community. So we follow a rule of life together based on prayer, work, table and neighbor. And so we're in the process of figuring out some simple visuals that can help us teach the children. There, there are an increasing number of children in the circle of people who come to Spring Forest to worship, to volunteer, to pray together, and to share a community meal. So what we're doing at Spring Forest with our friends, this sort of concentric circles of friends, is we are... Um, we're sort of a laboratory for new forms of rural ministry, not only for the United Methodist Church in North Carolina, but for others who come to visit us. I've been involved in experimental communities for about 12 years. Uh, I got involved um, because I wanted to. <laughs> I wanted to. I wanted to live in community because I longed to have people around me that I could pray with every day. That was the root longing. I wanted a community of family-like friends that we, we could pray morning and evening. We could be honest with each other. We could help each other do life and uh, have fun. So this was a longing. And it was also the calling of the Spirit to focus my research and writing in this area. It all kind of converged about 12 years ago. Three years ago, my brother... Mike, who is a decorated Vietnam veteran uh, and, and has, has suffered much in life because of our childhood and so on, he came to North Carolina with my sister to visit, and he was very curious about us living in community. And so we were eating dinner. We were all sitting around the table telling stories, laughing, and things like this. And Mike, uh, Mike interrupted all of a sudden, and he says this. He says, you know, I get it. I, I can see why you want to do this. If a person would live this way, it would be so much easier to be good. And he was right. So much easier to be good. And what the world is needing from us right now, church, is for us to be good. To do justice. To love chesed. 
to walk humbly with our God. Chesed talked about that yesterday. It's the steadfast, immovable, absolutely persistent love of God that will not let us go. To love that, we become like the God we love. When we love that God, we become like that God. And we become good news to our neighbors. So our, our goal in developing an alternative form of church that includes a new monastic community, a farm that is uh, going to be generating income to pay for the mission so that we become self-sustaining economically, a dinner church that will start in the fall, and then the retreat and teaching ministries because people come to us to learn about community and all kinds of things, people that are doing vocational discernment. Our goal in all of this is to actually struggle with the struggles we all have, but to struggle forward with God, to help our failures become a learning source for other people, and to trust that God is doing a new thing and we get to be a part of it. So that's what we're up to. And this is what I want to talk to you about for a couple of minutes. Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, Jesus said, I am with you. Do you remember that text from Matthew 18? I love it. It's right, it's right in the context for that statement is Jesus is talking to them about how to have a dispute, <laughs> how, to, how to disagree with each other and what to do when you're mad at each other and that kind of thing. And so the, the cellular unit of church is two or three people gathered around the Holy Trinity, because that's what in Jesus' name, Jesus is part of the Trinity, right? A community. God is community. Two or three people gathered around God in order to love, to trust, and to participate with what God is doing in the world. If you have that happening, you have church. It's so simple. It's so powerful. So what is happening in this new reformation that's emerging now and is gaining steam is God is calling forth the cellular units again and calling us away from our obsession with bigness and muchness and power. God's calling us back to small and taking our time and getting real in the neighborhood. I think of it as neighborhood theology. So, yesterday I introduced Oswald Chambers' definition of a disciple. A disciple is someone who bears a strong family likeness to Jesus Christ. And if we're going to bear the gospel faithfully into our neighborhoods, the result will be more disciples who bear a strong family likeness to Jesus Christ. But the question is, which Jesus are we talking about? Because there are a lot of Jesuses out there. I, I put a few of them up here for your edification. So, so there's, there's Jesus with the lamb, the baby sheep, Jesus meek and mild, and you know that, that Jesus that we're familiar with. A lot of those pictures hanging in old Sunday school rooms in the basement of the church. And then uh, there's Jesus with the tat who's kind of tough and probably rides a Harley. And there's Jesus the scholar at the top right-hand corner, uh, has my kind of glasses, and it's Professor Jesus, and he's all kind of on a head trip, right? <laughs> Says a lot of words like exegesis and hermeneutics. <laughs> and then down here is, is a Jesus that probably looks more like the Jesus of history looked, uh, a Middle Eastern man who works outdoors and probably olive-skinned and dark hair. And then... In the middle here, we've got Jesus and his buddies taking a selfie. <laughs> I was looking for images of Jesus um, where, you know, Jesus was criticized for eating and drinking with the wrong people. He was actually called a glutton and a drunk by his detractors. And so I was looking for a picture and I found that one. I thought, this is perfect until I looked closer and I realized I'd have to put the Asian Jesus carefully above that one guy's hand because you know what's underneath there. <laughs> anyway. We bear a strong family likeness to the Jesus that we think is the Jesus. Is this making sense? We become like the God we adore. We take on the characteristics of the God that we actually bow to. 
And in order for us to bear the gospel faithfully into the world during this new reformation, we need to reacquaint ourselves with the actual Jesus of the actual gospels. I encourage you to read through the gospels, paying close attention to Jesus' behavior, even more than his words. Just try it once. Behavior more than words. Because we know from the prologue of John's gospel, we know from Colossians chapter one and some other verses in the Bible, that Jesus reveals to us everything there is to know that we need to know about what God is like. Jesus reveals to us the unseen God. In Colossians, Paul says, Jesus is the icon, the image of the unseen God. And so we're supposed to watch what Jesus does in the Gospels. And then that becomes the interpretive key for how we are to be in the world and for how we are to interpret scripture. Did you ever notice how Jesus said, you've heard it said, but I say to you, and then he says whatever it is, and then he gets into a whole lot of trouble with religious stiffs. That's what happens. He's reinterpreting his own tradition. He's reinterpreting scripture. So reacquainting ourselves with the behavior of Jesus in the gospels will give us insight that we need in order to heal the wounds of colonialism and imperialism and all those other evil isms done in the name of evangelism and mission. We've got to start acting like the real Jesus. When God became flesh and came into the world, he, he took on flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. This is, this is a modern picture of Nazareth. He goes to Nazareth, and it's the kind of place, um, I live in the south now, I live in the southeast, but my, my mother's family, our relatives are from Kentucky, and it's the land of hillbillies, right? And uh, people who live back in the hollers, that kind of thing. And Jesus, coming from Nazareth, had the sort of accent when he talked that people identified him with the sort of Judean version of hillbillies. Uh, sort of, does anything good come from Nazareth? Who's from Nazareth? Well, Jesus. So God right away identifies with the oddest group of people. Jesus comes and is a refugee baby. <laughs> right away, he's, his family has to flee for their lives as refugees to another country and hope that the other country will take them in. And so we, so we find these stories about God. When God comes into the world, this is God's methodology to come and identify in a very particular place with very particular people and to bring love there, the healing and saving love there. So along with reacquainting ourselves with Jesus, the real Jesus of the real gospels, his behavior and letting his behavior interpret his words for us, there are some other places we need to look today for some guidance as to how to be in our neighborhoods in a way that people can receive the love of God. One of the major ways that the gospel spread among the Celts, we, we just sang, Be Thou My Vision, very timely worship planners, thank you. <laughs> One of the ways that the gospel spread, a primary way, was through the planting of new faith communities. And I just want to describe to you briefly how they did this. And it wasn't, it wasn't the way we typically plant new churches in our context. Certainly not the way United Methodists have done it in the last 20, 30 years. So what they would do in the top left-hand um, image there, let, let that represent a village, a little village or a town among the Celts. And um, in the middle top image, there's that thing that looks like a birthday cake. It's not really a birthday cake. <laughs> it's a little cluster of men, women, and children, young and old, single and married, that were a new monastic community at the time. They were people who were gathered together to move and live for the sake of their neighbors. So far, so good. So they would go to the village, to the outside of the village or the town, and they would go to the um, to the, the, the chief or the laird or whoever was leading that village, the town, and they would say, uh, this is who we are. We'd like your permission to live on the outside of the village. We have our own flocks. We'll manage our own livelihood. And uh, we'd just like to be close by and practice our own faith. Is that okay with you? 
And if they were, said, if they were told yes, great. If they were told not, they peacefully left. They didn't make a, a big fuss. They didn't threaten fire from heaven. They didn't damn and shame people. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they just said, okay, and they moved on. So they went where they were welcome, and they spoke the truth. This is what we want to do. Okay, when they were welcomed, over here to the top right-hand image, they would begin to um, get acquainted with the people in the town. They would go in there for trading purposes, and they would look around and identify where are their needs in this town. Where are their orphans? Where are their widows? Where are the sick people? Where is there some kind of need for education, for help? And they would begin serving the people in the town, meanwhile raising their own food and, and managing their own business in their own little community. Well, this attracted notice, as you might think. <laughs> So over time, as they built relationships with people in town, and they were demonstrating that they were to give themselves away to the people in the town, people would start asking questions. Why are you doing this? This is interesting. <laughs> and so they would say, well, because we worship Jesus, and this is the way uh, we're, we live our faith. This is the kind of God we serve. And so people, out of asking questions and having conversations, these relationships of trust would form, genuine friendships that were mutual. Down here at the bottom left-hand image, over time, over time, as the people in the town grew to trust these newcomers, they would go out to visit their little monastic community. And uh, when, the, when they would go there, they would be met by the abbot, the spiritual leader for the community, who would then wash their feet. They must have been Mennonites did foot washing. <laughs> Wash their feet, welcome them, and assign an Anamkara, a soul friend. And it was the Anamkara's job to sort of be a guide for them and answer questions as they came up. Kind of like good Montessori theory, right? Any Montessori teachers or people that have had your kids in Montessori school? So in Montessori theory, um, People, you teach people when they're ready to learn the new skill, and you, and you can tell when they're ready because they'll ask questions. They'll, they'll let you know when they're ready to learn that new thing. I think God is a Montessori teacher. <laughs> but this is what they would do, and there was no hurry, there was no rush, there was not a three-year timeline, and we're going to pull the plug and do an autopsy on the failed plant. There was nothing like that. So over time, people came to faith because they belonged, they were welcomed, they belonged. They got to um, watch people behave who claimed to follow Jesus. They got to watch them behave, they got to behave with them. And out of the belonging and the behaving, they began to believe. We talked about that yesterday, the process that Diana Butler Bass outlines in Christianity After Religion. We also looked yesterday at that word believe, that that's a Middle English word that means to love and trust. To love and trust. That love and trust in the real God of the Gospels emerged in this context of relationships and trustworthy behavior. Doing justice, loving chesed, and walking humbly with their God. So then, the next thing that happened right here in this bottom right-hand image, there were enough people in the town now that were following Jesus, they would build a church, a building, some of them nice cathedrals, <laughs> and that would become the center for healing and learning in the community to help the whole town flourish. The idea here was to help the town flourish because God's love was there. Then the next thing that would happen over time is more people would gather together into a new, new monastic community and be sent out to go somewhere else and repeat the process. Isn't that beautiful? So the question for us today, we don't go in next to a town and we're not to slavishly replicate that. But the principle is to go and be a blessing and help the neighborhood flourish, to form real life friendships and to have spiritual leaders who were astute enough to actually be Anamkaras. Does this make sense to you? So we need lay people who are being formed as disciples who have a deep knowledge of God and know how to pray and know how to interpret scripture and know how to love well, 
who can companion their neighbors. This is how the church will spread in the future. This is what people need from post, the church in post-Christendom parts of the world. Because Christendom, that unholy alliance of the Christian religion with secular power and authority and political clout, that has caused so much harm that we now have to undo. We, we now have to take stock of it. We now have to reverse engines and really return to a genuinely gospel understanding of sharing our faith. So the church of the future is apostolic. It's the sent out people. It's a Eucharistic church. In other words, we become the bread and the wine that God gives to our neighbors, the broken bread and the poured out wine. Henry Nouwen in his book, Life of the Beloved, talks about how we are the bread and the wine. And he's drawing from an image of St. Paul in the epistles, that we are the bread and wine. We're like a multi-grain loaf. And God is like the great baker. And I can just see God's sleeves rolled up and the dough is there and God is kneading the dough. I used to make bread a lot when my kids were growing up. I remember the time I mixed up this big batch of dough. I put it in the mixing bowl. I put a nice clean dish towel over the top, the way you do. And I set it on top of the refrigerator where it could rise because the air is warmer up there, right? And then I went off and forgot all about it. I got busy doing something. <laughs> I came back later and there was this dough just sort of dripping down the side of the refrigerator. It was this horrible blobby thing. <laughs> but God is like a baker and brings us together and mixes us into this loaf. When we gather, God is mixing us again into this loaf. And, and God bakes us in holy love. And then God breaks the loaf apart and sends us each out into a different neighborhood, different street, a different place where we work, so that we can be the bread and wine for our neighbors. Then when we gather back together again, God pulls us in. This is what it means to be gathered and sent, to be good news. If we don't understand and embrace this missional, this apostolic identity, we're going to completely miss the new thing that God is doing. This is what it means to be the church. This is what Jesus had in mind. Here's my happy artwork again for you. So in this understanding of church that I'm describing for you, God's love is at the center. Remember when two or three are gathered around God? That's the heart there. And these little green arrows represent us being sent out. And these little yellow dots represent all the different places where we are. Each one of you in this room is unrepeatable. You will never be repeated, even if they cloned you. The actual life experiences you've had will not be repeated. We are infinitely precious, each one of us. And so God sends us out to be the love of God in that unique place we occupy in the world. And this understanding of church frees us from ourselves. When we think of church in this way, that we're the community of sent out ones, then suddenly all those things that have divided us and uh, caused us to be OCD and, you know, carpets and chicken dinners and the rummage sale and who gets to be in charge around here and who gets to count the money and you know, all these things that make us upset and get mad. Those things fade into insignificance. Now the model of church that we have been indoctrinated in in the last hundred years, I think of as consumer church in Christendom context. Consumer church, this is my little drawing of a consumer church. Let's go back to the other one first. In in missional church or apostolic church, it's kind of like, um, do you watch the Weather Channel? Okay. You know on the Weather Channel, you see those hurricane cloud patterns? You know what I'm talking about? They're all scary and they're coming this way and we have more and more of them now and they're bigger and bigger. So the thing about hurricanes, and I've really, really gotten familiar with this now that I live in North Carolina, the way hurricanes... Uh, manage energy. So hurricanes take the energy from the center 
and fling it out. So that swirling pattern is energy that's being flung out. That's why even if the center of the hurricane is over the water, we get heavy rain up in the mountains of North Carolina. So far, so good? It flings it out. So I apologize for using destructive weather patterns to make my point. <laughs> Consumer church, on the other hand, is like a tornado. Now, tornadoes are different. I've lived in Ohio for a long time. And there are plenty of tornadoes in Ohio and in Texas, where I lived for a number of years. So tornadoes are kind of the opposite. They take the energy out here and pull it into the middle. They suck things in and spin them around, right? And so... In a consumer understanding of church, we have to have a special building and programs, and we suck people in. Our hope is to get them sucked in there. And we spin them around on committees and meetings, and they can't get out. And the longer they're in there, the less they know their neighbors, and pretty soon they don't have any friends that aren't in there. And they're exhausted. And, and we preach at them to go get to know their neighbors, but we don't let them go do it because we're too busy spinning them around. And we mean well. But we're killing people. <laughs> and it's, it's against the gospel. When God came among us, God was flung out into these very particular places. So what does this mean for us today? In this new Reformation that is now underway, and we're at the front end of it in post-Christendom parts of the world, I want to emphasize that it's particular parts of the world, including Canada. It's not everywhere in the world, because different parts of the world are in different places with how the church is struggling and how the church is thriving. So we need a lot of experiments right now to help us move out of the walls of the church to allow ourselves to be flung out. Does this make sense? The established institutional church has anxiety in its system because of decline. And we're, 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 some of us are wringing our hands and we're trying to figure out how to pay the bills and get all hunkered down and uptight and we get TMJ and all of that stuff. <laughs> but really what we need, what we need is a thing that we find hard when we feel afraid and that is we need to play. We need to experiment. We're going to do a lot of experiments that don't last very long, and that's necessary. Those are not failed attempts. Those are experiments. Now, where I live in North Carolina is one of the most biodiverse regions in North America. Biodiverse. So, so the variety of bugs and plants is, uh, is mind-boggling. And that variety of bugs and plants make for a healthier environment. One of the reasons that factory farming is so bad for us is it removes the variety of bugs and plants and the microbes in the soil get killed and it's... So one of the reasons why biodiversity is helpful to the ecological health of an area is that experimentation and adaptation is going on all the time so that life can continue. That's a wonderful metaphor for us for what God is doing now and calling forth new kinds of faith communities, new experiments, new forms of church. As we're in this space, please hear me well, all we need in order to be church is two or three people gathered around God to love God, to participate with what God is doing, to honor God, and to allow God to flow through us into our neighborhood. That, that's the basic unit of church. So we need all kinds of experimentation to go on. Another feature of this new Reformation that we must pay attention to, and I think probably Mennonites do a much better job of it than Methodists do, because we're, we are, Methodism is very hierarchical. We've got a bishop that's you know, got the Episcopal system and all that stuff. But we have to figure this out too. So that word liturgy, the ancient meaning of the word liturgy was work of the people, and it was not a religious word. It, re it referred to people who do work for the common good, such as in our culture, we'd say firefighters and policemen and park workers and people like that, people that are doing work for the public good. So it's doing work for the good of the people. It's work for the people by the people. And what we have to do now 
is return to that understanding of liturgy. Not that liturgical resources are unimportant or anything like that. Having a new hymnal is important. Having uh, thoughtful worship experiences is important. But what's really, really important right now is for us to find ways and make it a, a high priority to equip lay people for robust ministry in their own neighborhoods and to do it in ways that are non-manipulative, non-violent, not to make a profit, right? In other words, very much like the way the Celts carried the gospel across Ireland and Scotland and all those parts. The work of the people. So we need to rethink theological education, especially for lay people. And finally, the last uh, thing that I want to mention as I bring this uh, part of my presentation to a close is that when you study the book of Acts, and we've had wonderful readings from the book of Acts today, when you study the book of Acts and you look to see why did the gospel spread so quickly in the book of Acts, what was it? And you see this, signs and wonders accompanied the preaching of the word, and that convinced people, right? The signs and wonders accompanying the preaching convinced people this is true. So there were people healed, the lame man jumping up and leaping and walking, um, the dead raised, the hungry fed, these signs and wonders. In this new reformation, there must be signs and wonders, and there's a particular type of sign and wonder that our neighbors need from us. And that is the sign and wonder of reconciliation. The sign and wonder of working together across lines for the good of the world. It's the sign and wonder of acting like Jesus in this world. Many people today have a negative image of Christianity because of what makes the newspaper, what gets on to the evening news. The extremists on left and right get on there, especially, especially um, right now with our political divisions. So a church that actually heals the sinful isms and phobias instead of contributing to them, a church that heals racism, sexism, all those other isms, this is the sign and wonder that our neighbors need. And this is the sign and wonder that God is calling for from us in this new reformation. Let's join together in prayer. We thank you, God, for the wonderful gift of calling us into this time that we get to be a part of the new thing that you're doing. And yes, we do perceive it. Give us courage, we pray. Help us to have the long view and not just this short, anxious gaze. Help us pull together as communities of faith for the sake of our neighbors. This world needs you. And we know you have ways that we can't even imagine to reach our neighbors. So we say yes to what you have in mind. Help us where we're unwilling to become willing. <laughs> Give us courage. Help us use our voices, our hands, and our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>